Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our program. The U.S. Secret Service, before, during, and after the assassination attempt of President Trump. Please welcome Mike Howell, Executive Director of the Heritage Foundation's Oversight Project. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Howell, Executive Director of the Oversight Project, which is the investigation and litigation arm of the Heritage Foundation. 44 days ago, an assassin's bullet came within centimeters of ending the life of President Donald J. Trump. And with that, it could have forever changed the trajectory not only of the United States of America, but of Western civilization itself, and with that, the course of human events in this world. We literally all dodged a bullet that day. But since then, we still don't know nearly enough, and there are reasons for that. You know, a few days after the event, much of the media began trying to discredit what just happened in front of the eyes of all of the United States of America. Pundits were claiming he wasn't even shot. Others were trying to push narratives that this is somehow just a par for the course event. We have been greeted since then with numerous momentous events, whether it's President Biden dropping out and Harris running or any of the other types of black swan events that have occurred. Effectively, this assassination attempt was memory hold for a lot of the country. We aim to change that today. We're going to have two major events here, and I'll deal with the second one first before I get into introductions for the first. At noon, there will be a congressional hearing held here at the Heritage Foundation. We'll hear testimony from Dan Bongino, a former Secret Service agent, Ben Schaefer, a sniper who was there in Butler, Pennsylvania, and Eric Prince, somebody who knows quite a bit about not only the threat environment across the world, but how to keep people safe. Before we do that, we're going to have a panel discussion about the long history of the Secret Service and how to fix it. Now, many of you know Jason Chaffetz, you know, from his time on, on Fox News and out there in the media as an author and, and commentator. But before that, he was the chairman of the Oversight Committee, where I actually had the pleasure to work for him. In that capacity, he led the largest external investigation into the Secret Service, which culminated in 2015 with a voluminous report titled The Secret Service, an Agency in Crisis. That report not only detailed a lot of the major security incidents that had occurred during the Obama administration and prior, but several key problems at the agency in need of immediate fixing. Of course, those issues were not, not fixed and not solved for. And he's going to walk through today this kind of long pattern that has led this agency to be in this very vulnerable position that we find itself in today. So without further ado, Chairman Chaffetz, please join us on stage. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for addressing this. This is uh, something we all need to take seriously. I, uh, that bullet came so close to changing the trajectory of our country and politics. And you had a shooter who was not very sophisticated. He wasn't stealthy, wasn't necessarily creative, put up a drone. Secret Service said they couldn't put up a drone. Goes up on the roof wearing camo on a white roof with a pitch that evidently the Secret Service can't deal with, according to the director. And you see where we are today. And I worry that these problems are not just fixed overnight. They're not just, hey, let's throw more people at the situation, even though it's pretty well documented at this point that resources were, were diminished um, beyond what was originally requested. What I want to go through is I want to remind people how we got here. And probably as important as anything, what we got to do to fix it. Because we've been yelling at the top of our lungs for nine years that this is an agency in crisis and it is a zero fail mission and they have been failing us. Now, at the Oversight Committee, it was really interesting. The way we got involved in this is they do, a, they do a survey of government morale, and right near the very bottom of the morale, literally hundreds of departments and agencies, right at the bottom was the Secret Service. We also had a tip line at the Oversight Committee, and the tip line was we get probably 20 to 25 calls, people that can call in and say, hey, look at this, look at that. 
the number one agency and department that we were getting tips from? The Secret Service. You put those two together and it really, it really highlighted for us that there is a serious problem. The Secret Service has got a reputation of being impenetrable. The premier law enforcement agency out there. But unfortunately, the moment we started peeling back the onion, and I want to I want to make sure it's very clear. We did this in a very bipartisan way. That final report that we issued, some 400 plus pages, has my name on it. It has Elijah Cummings' name on it. We looked at more than 150 security incidents, 150. And I can tell you with just about each and every one of them, we as a nation, as a people, got lucky. You had shots fired at the White House. They didn't even know that it happened. Meanwhile, the bullets hit the White House. We had shots fired at Vice President Biden's home in Delaware. Wanted to come back and see what the footage was like and wanted to see what the incident looks like. Ends up that the Secret Service had no cameras at the Vice President's home. Literally no cameras. No video. Nobody was caught. Meanwhile, shots are fired. Secret Service agents are outside and nothing happens. We had a man with a gun who was next to President Obama riding up in an elevator. See, President Obama had gone down to the Centers for Disease Control before COVID and was touring. And I'm giving this just kind of a rough outline, but the president goes there and they have a local security force that is there guarding the Centers for Disease Control. President Obama gets on the elevator as they go up. The local security person is allowed to join the Secret Service and the president, pretty tight quarters in an elevator, where this person was asking to do a selfie and started asking the president questions. Strange enough that the Secret Service, at least one of the agents, decided to interview this person. The president gets off, doesn't do a picture. They pull this security guard over to the side and they say to this person, what were you doing? What were you thinking about? They get the private security agency's boss in the room and his boss is excoriating this guy saying, what are you doing? You can't take pictures of the president. You gotta, you're fired. In fact, give me your gun. And to which the secret service said, you have a gun? And then they were informed that all of the people that were there had guns. And the Secret Service didn't know that. They did not know that. There were over 50 guns in that proximity with President Obama, one of which was riding in the elevator. Now, the problem with the Secret Service is they tried to cover it up. We were actually able to see that after the incident, people from Washington, D.C. were flying back down to Atlanta, which created a lot of suspicion. We got some whistleblowers. And then we held a hearing with Director Pearson where she testified falsely that um, there were never any security threats to President Obama. And if there were, she was going to brief the president. And when I met and talked with, I think it's Neil Eggleston, who is the uh, general counsel for the White House, she resigned the next day because she lied to Congress. Part of the problem and the challenge that we see here is that the Secret Service has a culture of deception. What they tell the public has routinely been inaccurate, if not an outright lie. If you recall back during our investigation, we had a series of fence jumpers this is not Carl Lewis out there in Crocs, you know, running. Up. These are people jumping the fence, running across the lawn, and then getting into the White House in some cases. We had one incident where literally in Crocs, jumps the fence, goes through the bushes, goes through the front door. Secret Service, if you go back and look at the record, they went back and told us that, oh, we never got in the White House. They had to later admit that, yeah, he got in the White House, got in, turned left. He could have gone upstairs where the president, uh, president's residence is. No, he turned left, and he turned right, turned right again before he was finally tackled. This happened a couple of times in a row. I watched footage of somebody who jumped the fence at night, undetected, got right up to, I believe it was the East Portico, and sat on a fence 
I think it was nine or 10 minutes. He just sat there. I think he was ready to get arrested, but nobody came. We had agents from the uniform division walk by him and not even notice him because I don't think they thought that he was really, there was probably even going to ever be somebody there. And this went on for close to 15 minutes before they finally detected him. These types of incidents kept happening time and time and time again. And let me tell you about some of the findings that we unearthed along the way. And I, I want to give you the five, five things that I think we're going to find as we do the investigation, as the investigation is done into the incident and the assassination attempt of President Trump, and we look at other types of security incidents, I think it's gonna, it's gonna fall down in five buckets, in my opinion. It's gonna come down to recruiting, training, workload, which I wanna get into a little bit, communications, and technology. All five of these categories, I give the Secret Service an F. Now, we talk about the Secret Service, but this really goes to Alejandro Mayorkas, the Secretary of Homeland Security, who should know better because he's been, if not the Secretary, he's been like the number two person there for a long time. You have congressional reports. You have other reports that were done. You have multiple reports. You have a blue ribbon panel that Jay Johnson, the Secretary, put out. The, the, we have, I'm tired of having reports. Let's go through each of those five, and then I'll give you back some illustrations on some of those incidents that I talked about. Remember, we looked at 150 of them, okay? Recruitment. They are still, the Secret Service is still more than 1,000 agents, and there's agents, and then there's uniform division to, in its simplest form, okay? When you go to the White House, you go walk around over there to the Naval Observer, you're going to see Secret Service in the uniform division. They're wearing uniforms. They got badges. It's plainly obvious that they're in the Secret Service. Others, they are broken down into multiple different groups, but these you'll find in the field offices, you'll find them undercover, you'll see there's lots of different agents, and I'm just using generic terms to have the simplicity. It's much, much more complicated than that. The recruitment is such, and it was true nine, ten years ago, that they were short more than a 1,000 people from their authorized levels of staffing. The problem with that is it segues into the workload. When you're short that many people, you have too many people working overtime. Let me give you this statistic here that's in one of the reports, and I think Tristan, will, he's going to lay out, he's, he does a good job of this. He's going to lay out these different, there's a GAO report, there's the, what's the other one? NAPA. I don't know all these acronyms mean, but this is this is from the fiscal year 2020. Approximate number of overtime hours per officer in fiscal year 2020. Okay, approximate number of overtime hours per officer, 537 hours of overtime. Now, one of the last bills I worked to pass when I left Congress in 2017 was this idea that we needed to pay our Secret Service agents and officers overtime because statutorily they tap out. We were finding that on the workload side of it, many of these agents were working 45, 47 days in a row. And it's hard travel, right? It, you're on the road. You don't even have time to do your laundry. You're working 12, 14, 16-hour shifts supposed to be you know, ready to go. Some of these places are hot, you're sweaty, and you can't get your laundry done. Meanwhile, your family life suffers because you're on day 46 and you're having to tell your spouse, guess what? I'm not getting paid for this, but I gotta keep doing my job. And it was sad, I mean, it's just sad how bad this was. So the recruitment ties into the workload but I want to make another, th the recruitment was pathetic. They were doing it on pizza boxes. They were doing it on bumper stickers, on cars. There was no serious effort to bring in. And what they also found through these reports is if you look at it, once they did get somebody uh, you know, brought up to speed and really good, the FBI would go and steal them. Because the FBI had a better track for IT personnel. They could pursue their IT skills and make a good living at it over at the, at the Department of Justice. They didn't have a program like that and still don't have a program, pro, program like that at the, at the Department of Homeland Security. 
So as they go and they look at that, and then you get to over to the workload problems. And here's another thing that's a factor, okay? There's a lot of boredom. There's a lot of nothing happens until something happens. But when something does happen, remember, you're there to prevent it so it never, ever happens. And that's a tough mindset to try to teach people to get into that, to that uh, setting. What's interesting, though, with the workload is you have more than 100 and I think more than 150 field offices for the Secret Service. Most of the time, most of what they do is work on currency issues and credit card issues. People going up to, to, uh, to uh, gas pumps and swiping ATM machines and coming up with technology to rip people off. That's the Secret Service that dives into those issues. So if you're working in the Seattle office or the Salt Lake City office or the Phoenix office, you know, smaller offices for the Secret Service, you're going to spend the overwhelming amount of your time on this. But then all of a sudden, Donald Trump Jr. is coming to town or Melania is in town or Kamala Harris is coming to town. And guess what? You got to drop all of that. And then you put on this other hat and says, oh, now I'm on the protective detail. But the training becomes a huge, massive problem. If you look at the number of classes and the time that they spend actually training to do the protective mission, it's pathetic. The recommendation for some of the personal protective divisions was, the recommendation was 25% of an agent's time is supposed to be in training. The reality is it's like one or 2%. Sometimes they do zero classes. I think it was 2013, they had no classes, none, not even one, because they were so short of the personnel, they couldn't afford to have somebody go do training. The one criticism I have of Congress, Congress has almost tripled their budget through the years, but one of the, the issues I have with Congress is they have not fully funded the request from the Secret Service to build a mock White House. We interviewed Uniform Division, people who were working at the White House who told us when we said, how come you didn't follow that guy in the Crocs? How come you didn't follow him in the White House? He said, oh, I'm not allowed in the White House. I said, what do you mean you're not allowed in the White House? You work for the Secret Service. He said, uh, uh, Chairman, i not allowed in the White House. In fact, I've never been in the White House. You've never been in the White House. You didn't get in line to do a tour like you could do with, no, I've never done it. Not allowed in there. Never been in the White House. That's why he didn't chase him into the White House. You can watch the video. You can see that the person stops. He's like, I can't go in there. I'm not allowed to be in there. The training is absolutely pathetic. And if you look at the attack on President Trump, what you're going to find is that that extraction was embarrassing. It was absolutely, totally embarrassing. Didn't know how to holster their gun. Didn't, need to, didn't know how to get the president into the vehicle. Once he gets in the vehicle, can't move him. Then somebody's got to figure out how to open up the gate. Nobody knows how to open up the gate. I mean, it, it's pathetic. And it's an embarrassment. I got to move quickly through these other, other ones as well. But these things have to be addressed. Because if you are overworked, you maybe weren't hired the best possible way, and then you're undertrained, guess what you're going to get? Now, communications is a massive problem. They have not properly invested in the people that know how to have communications. We found, and the reports will back this up, that they could not get security clearances for the agents and officers, and so sometimes they put them out there without a proper security clearance. You don't have a security clearance, guess what? You're not getting a radio. We talked to uniform division people who would go and work at the White House, and say, how come with these people jumping the fence, how come you didn't go chase them? How come you didn't engage? And they would say, I didn't have a radio. I didn't know what happened. And guess what? Let's say you all have radios. Let's say you're all working at the White House, or let's say you're all working in Pennsylvania or Atlanta or whatever, and you're on the bus tour with Kamala Harris. If something does happen, what happens? Your natural instinct is everybody starts talking. When everybody starts talking, nobody can hear. And that's the paralysis that happens. And if you don't train for it and know how to deal with it and have a chain of command that then knows how to give you instructions as to what's happening, where it's happening, you have a meltdown like happened in Pennsylvania. 
That gets to the last point, which is about technology. Technology is one of the scariest things out there. It should be our friend. I can say this now because it's been about 10 years and hopefully they've solved it. When I finally got the chief technology officer for the Secret Service in a non-classified setting, this is why I feel comfortable talking about it, and asked him about to just candidly tell me where the problems are, I went through each and every president, not their kids, not the other protectees. I said, tell me about George W. Bush. Is he fully protected? I don't think I've said this out loud before. The answer was no. His place in Crawford, Texas, none of the sensors worked. None. I said, you've got Secret Service, you've got a highly targeted president of the United States, former president of the United States. He's out there in the middle of Texas, and you're telling me that these Secret Service agents are out on this big, massive ranch with no sensors, no cameras, no motion detectors, nothing. What do you do when it's dark and it's, and it's raining? We don't have anything out there. That is terrible embarrassment. He's one of the most targeted people in our country. We went through this with President Clinton. We went through this with, I mean, I went down the line. We, I told you about Vice President, Vice President uh, um, Biden. Shots fired. Nobody caught. Shots fired at the White House, hitting, hitting the kids' bedrooms. They didn't even know for three days. You had a rookie officer at one time. Shots are fired in proximity to the White House. They didn't believe her. She was right. They were wrong. Nobody caught, no, nothing happened. It just goes on and on and on. And I'm telling you, the technology part of this equation is complicated and you, you hesitate to talk about it because you want to make sure that the enemy doesn't know where the vulnerabilities are. But technology is supposed to be our friend, it's supposed to be our asset, the thing that's hidden. And at least nine years ago, we pointed all of this out. It takes investment, it takes personnel, it takes expertise, it takes training, it takes communication, and it takes recruiting the right people. And when you don't have those five factors coming together, you continue to have the fiasco that we have here today. I could go on and on and on with stories. And that was from a while ago, but unfortunately, I don't get the sense that anything has changed because I still see the culture of deception Remember when, they, when the incident first happened, what did the Secret Service tell us? I loved it when, first of all, they didn't have a press conference. They let an FBI person go up there. And I loved it when the FBI person went up there. What did he tell us? He told us the night, like six hours after the attack, right? Terrible amount of time. He gets up there and he says, well, we don't have his name. And as soon as we have his name, we'll release it to you. That was a lie, okay? I was working at Fox News and we were looking at the name because it was given to us by some, some people that you know knew what the name was. They were lying about that. Then they said, he's a 20-year-old male. I said, how do you know he's 20 if you don't even know his name? Okay, I, but I buy that you can say he's an, uh, is a male. And then they said, well, there's no ongoing threat. How do you know there's an on, no ongoing threat if you don't even know his name? They lie about these things, and now they continue to tell us these fables and these stories that are not true. And Congress, they're going to have to stand up for themselves. They're going to have to continue to do this. And let me go back. I wanted to make one more point about training as I wrap up here. This is from one of those reports that was done. Here's the question. It's the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey, okay? This is a question. Here's the question. I am given a real opportunity to improve my skills in my organization. You know who is dead last? Counter sniper unit. 12% said yes. 12% of counter snipers. Here's the next question. How satisfied are you with the training you receive for your present job? You know who is dead last? Counter sniper unit. 7% said yes. What do you think the other 93% are saying? And I bet you, to, I bet you seven, about 6% of those other ones are just doing it to try to not cause waves and not be the sticking their heads up. That's how bad this situation is. And that's on Alejandro Mayorkas. He's the one that's doing this. And one other thing I should mention, the blue ribbon panel that was put together by Jay Johnson made a recommendation. The next head of the Secret Service, 
should be somebody from the outside. Don't hire somebody from the inside. Hire somebody from the outside who doesn't have the relationships, doesn't have the, the ties. Bring them in. you got to redo this organization. What did Joe Biden do? Joe Biden went out and hired somebody who was on the Biden vice presidential detail. They liked her. Jill liked her. That's how we got the director that we got. That's how she got her job. I'm sorry, but that, that is the, the facts of how she got her job. There's so much more to this equation. Um, I really do believe that the, the solution to this, in part, is to shed off, take the Secret Service, take their financial investigative units, and move that back to the Treasury. If it's about credit cards, if it's about currency, put it back in Treasury. Let them focus on their protective mission, and that would go a long way. There's lots of other ideas. I've gone past my time. I want to hear from these other three. So thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening. Thanks for caring about what's so important here. So appreciate it. Thank you, Jason, for uh, painting the picture that unfortunately is uh, shaping what we're dealing with today. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Laura Reese. I am the Director of the Border Security and Immigration Center here at Heritage and the Senior Research Fellow for Homeland Security. And I want to invite up to the stage our two guests today, uh, starting with Tristan Levitt, who is the President of Empower Oversight and the former uh, House Oversight Committee staff, as well as Susan Crabtree, the Real, Real Clear Politics National Political Correspondent, and the reporter most closely following what the Secret Service is doing and isn't doing. So please come on up to the stage. All right, Tristan, I'm, I'm gonna start with you and a little bit of the, this uh, extensive reporting and uh, committee work, past task force, blue ribbon panels that have all been done over the decades uh, that Jason had referred to. So in your comprehensive uh, December 2015 report that you worked on, you noted in the 2014 report uh, written by the panel of, uh, the, appointed by Secretary Jay Johnson of DHS, this is what that panel wrote, quote, Many of their recommendations are not new. Indeed, some of them precisely echo recommendations that the White House Security Review made in 1995, but that remain concerns today. Others even harken back to recommendations made in the Warren Commission report following the assassination of President Kennedy, end quote. Your committee report said, this inability to fix known problems is very dangerous for the US Secret Service and for those the agency is charged with protecting. Boy, is that an understatement as we sit here today. So after decades of these same issues, it seems that drastic changes are needed. What would you say are the top three changes that need to be done immediately? Absolutely. So certainly training is at the top of that as Jason identified and, and that just came through again and again and again. Again, this is a challenging job for anyone. It, it, we ask a lot of the Secret Service to be out there with a zero fail mission to protect these individuals and literally in some ways the fate of the free world rests on us. And so it's a job that requires a lot of commitment. It's a job that requires a lot of, um, a lot of time and, and attention. But, but as Jason mentioned, it can be boring at times. There's a lot of standing around. There's a lot of hurry up and wait. And so if these individuals who go there because they have a passion, they want to be able to serve our nation, why else would you go into the Secret Service? If they're not receiving the training that they need, you're not going to be prepared for these types of situations. And to, to look at some more recent data than what Jason mentioned, whereas the Protective Mission Panel of 2014 recommended 25% of the Presidential Protective Division and the Vice Presidential Protective Division, 25% of their time go to training. Since 2014, it has never gone above 7.5% for the Presidential Protective Division. For the VPD, it's never gone above 3%. So what does that tell you about the training that you're getting for others like former presidents or elected or uh, nominees for major parties, right? This is not a situation where they are ready for this big task. 
Some of the other recommendations were unsettling. Mike and I, who drafted that 2015 report, went down to Secret Service headquarters and read the 1995 classified report. There was a White House breach then. And again, these same things had not changed. So to see that training and other things haven't moved that needle over this decade is very, very disappointing. Another, they have to move to a threat-based protective model. So the model, again, is entirely based around you are the presidential protective division, you are the VP protective division. So again, you get down into your protective division for formers, you're for these other individuals. It's based purely on the title. So Donald Trump is anonymously here, right? He's someone that is a former. He's running for office again. Again, we're in a situation where the threats against him are going to be higher than almost anyone else, and they are still treating him like a third-rate protective responsibility. So that absolutely has to change. The final thing I would just say is, going back to this overall um, focus of the agency, they have to treat their employees with more respect. Yes, they need the, they need the uh, resources from Congress, but those have also been given over time. And people come to the agency and leave because they see that there's a double standard for employees. They see that if you're in with the good old boys club, and there's, I think we'll get to some allegations that maybe there's a good old girls club now too, but those are, those are situations where if people don't feel respected, they leave, and the Secret Service then is always having to retrain new individuals. That's such a bad thing for that particular. So let's move a little bit closer to the present. January 2021, January 6, in particular. Uh, the Inspector General for DHS has just issued a report about Secret Service's role in January 6. Susan, what's your major takeaway from that date, what happened, and, and the report? I haven't really absolutely focused on that because I'm more I've been, my reporting really focuses on uh, July 13th at the Butler rally and in the wake of that. But I did, of course, take a look at that DHS OIG report. And the bizarre thing about that was they are saying that they were, they, it, Vice President Kamala Harris got within 20 feet cast by this pipe bomb and the Secret Service had not detected it despite their, all of their, bomb sniffing dogs that went through there. We've all, anybody who's lived in Washington is familiar with the sweeps that they do. And the, do the bomb sniffing dogs are very good at their jobs. Um, and how, why then did Kamala Harris not talk about that incident at all? And she, you know, why didn't she say, well, that is a threat on my life. I'm very concerned about this fact that I, I actually passed by that bomb, that pipe bomb within 20 feet. We didn't hear anything about that. And now we're seeing footage by some of my colleagues at Real Clear Investigations that, in fact, there's footage showing that other, other law enforcement agents or officers also passed by that bomb and then came out quickly. Um, and then they found it minutes after a police officer went past that bomb and then found it minutes later. It just raises a lot of questions. Again, it's not my specialty. I haven't focused on that as much. But when I, oh, the other thing that we learned from that DHS OIG report is that they weren't giving her, uh, Kamala Harris, because she was a vice president elect, they hadn't outfitted her with all of the things that they should have by that time. And you just think, well, why not? It was, she was elected in November. And this was in January, January 6th. You had plenty of time to give her every protective service she needed. So that was my serious concern about the Secret Service's role in that. But other evidence is coming forward that raises serious questions about just what was, when did that pipe bomb get placed there? It's also been reported that Secret Service deleted tweets related to, and text, excuse me, text related to January 6th. Um, is, is that consistent with Secret Service protocol? Well, I did talk to different um, agents that were on, on duty. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm being parsing very carefully to make sure my sourcing, I'm not giving away anything. But I did talk to agents that were on duty that day, January 6th, and it wasn't until a few months later that they were asked for their phones. And they didn't, they weren't told that there was a software migration happening, is what Director Cheadle has told the committees, the investigative committees. 
that there was a software migration. That's why they deleted the tweets. But that's not what this, these agents have told me. These agents said we were well aware that they were covering up, that there were investigative committees looking into this, um, whether it be at the FBI or the co congressional committees. So they were well aware that they were giving up their phones so that the, the, all the text from that day would be deleted. And up until that point, the texts were st all still intact. Nobody had deleted anything from their work phone. So the Secret Service is supposed to be apolitical, protect anyone that they are assigned. And before July, we have a series of uh, rejections of requests for protection for RFK Jr. by Secretary Mayorkas's Homeland Security. Have we gotten to the point, Tristan, where we now can't trust a party in charge to protect political opponents. And what do we do about it if, if that's what we're facing now? Well, I, I am a believer in, in if institutions are broken, you've got to fix them, right? And so I think the most cost-effective way to, to ensure protection is to, is to fix the Secret Service rather than to turn outside. I certainly understand if any protectee, if any candidate feels like they need to go outside. Um, but I would say fix the Secret Service. And so there certainly have been proposals to take the position of director, which right now does not require Senate confirmation. So any president can remove someone at will. And there are reasons that's been the case historically, but to change that to maybe a 10-year 10-year uh, Senate confirmed position so as to create some sort of bipartisan element to that or just to ensure that it's not just, um, you know, again, so that if you are from a different party than that of the White House, that you can have some confidence in that position there. Um, but, but I think we have to. All, all the things. Our government relies on people who are in office working for the taxpayers and for the American public. And so if we get to a place where we can't trust that they are going to serve 50% of the population in whatever context, then we're probably broken beyond repair. So I, I can't believe that. I think we fixed the Secret Service. I think that they can provide the right protective detail, but you have to make changes so that everyone can have that confidence. Because obviously there are a lot of people out there who are of the belief that this was a setup, that this was intended to take down Donald Trump. And frankly, the Secret Service hasn't put out a lot of information to, to really help anyone understand otherwise. And so I, I am not inclined to, to believe that, but they have to do a better job of, of uh, again, acting in such a way and being transparent enough that everyone can view them as apolitical. All right, so after Butler, RFK Jr. receives protective service, and then after Friday's <laughs> announcement, they take it away. And, and he's still, obviously, he, he has not fully suspended his campaign. He's still, you know, an active candidate in, in a number of states. And, and so, again, these raise major questions about management at the Secret Service. And the other one um, that is deeply concerning to me is, and I reported on this in a piece in State and Real Clear Politics today, is that Robert O'Brien, who was a national security advisor for Donald Trump, the, the final one after John Bolton, uh, he is still doesn't have Secret Service protection. And we know uh, for a fact that the Iranian threat has been heightened, and we had this arrest of a Pakistani individual with ties to Iran who had just visited Iran for two weeks uh, and had come back to the United States in New York and was trying to recruit hitmen to take out Donald Trump and other individuals, most likely those who worked for Donald Trump when uh, they, when the John Bolton, who was before Robert O'Brien, ordered uh, this bombing of this Iranian General Soleimani, who's the right-hand man of, of, the, of Khomeini the top Iranian religious figure. So it just, um, it sort of stretches credulity, credulity to say that we're not going to, other people in the administration, certainly uh, Pompeo has protected, he has um, a diplomatic security service protection from the State Department. Um, other, Jake Sullivan, of course, the current national security advisor always gets protection. Uh, Brian Hook, also from the Trump administration, he ran the RAND desk, at the N I believe, at the NSC. He has protection, but Robert O'Brien doesn't have protection. Robert O'Brien endorsed Donald Trump. This is what people are concerned about. Why, are they, why does it look political? You know, certainly um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. thinks it's political because he had to spend $500,000 of his own money every month on his personal protection. And the day he endorses Donald Trump, that protection is taken away. Now, of course, the Secret Service says that we, we cannot provide. They're up to about 30 people 
that they're protecting right now, which is stretching their resources very thin. It is very true that that is the case. So then the Congress needs to do something about that. If it's a resource issue, which we know it is, and, we, and these, these Secret Service agents in Uniform Division are getting overtime, but they're not getting law enforcement overtime. That's usually time and a half in private, in, in, a, in cities and counties all over this country, they get time and a half. But the Secret Service just gets over regular overtime. So that has to change too, especially when they're working so much these, you know, seven days a week, 20. Another thing that I am I'm deeply concerned, I just heard about the other day, is that certain field office SACs, the special agent in charge of the field office, are and SES, um, the senior and senior executive service, which is paid much higher, and they're usually the, in charge of these field offices. They are getting bonuses to the tune of forty thousand dollars each. For and part of that equation is budget cuts. Okay, and not providing the resources that they request that for these rallies. They are always budget cut. There's always, they request a certain amount of assets, and what they are always told is, we are do, you will do more with less. Now, Ron Rowe, uh, two weeks ago, said that's going to end, that they're going to get more budget, they're going to get bigger budgets from Congress. But I'm told specifically that in the New York office, um, as the sources are telling me, that the sack of the New York office has reduced the amount of hotels that these people can get for overnight stays and reduces their, if they are only spending 15 and a half hours on the job. And they have to come in from New Jersey and other places into Manhattan. And some of the people are getting them and other people aren't. It breeds resentment. And also, why would you stay in the Secret Service? Why you just go to you know, U.S. Marshals, other places that, that you don't have these types of situations? So it's a long-winded answer, but um, I, I'm getting a lot of resentment about about these uh, bonuses that the SES are getting. Can I piggyback yeah. off part of that to, to the point about Congress giving resources? I mean, clearly every agency wants more resources, right? But the Secret Service is uniquely situated in that if they were to go and do the legwork to say, this is what it would take to fulfill our protective mission, Congress would have written them that check years ago. And that was recommended in 2014 by the Protective Mission Panel. We recommended it in our congressional report. And they've gotten budget increases since then. There have been times that Congress has given them more funding than they've requested. So yes, funding is a piece of it, as is, but as is often the case with many agencies, it's not the only piece. And it's incumbent on the Secret Service. And so it was years before they finally fulfilled the direction to do a zero-based budgeting, because they just kept coming back and saying, well, we got this amount last year. Let's ask for a little bit more. That's going to be good enough, right? But they had no actual research or anything to back up or just the legwork to say, this is what this will accomplish. And so I, I really still, that funding issue, I would put that right back on the Secret Service and say, it's on you. You tell us what it takes to accomplish this key mission. You tell us what it takes to protect these most important individuals in the United States, and we'll get you the resources. But don't show up with some charts and things and then say, well, uh, give us a little bit more money and we'll be fine, because that's what's happened again and again and again. So fast forward to following Butler, Pennsylvania in July. And now the U.S. House of Representatives has created a task force to look into the assassination attempt, and DHS Secretary Mayorkas has also stood up a task force. Uh, Trist Tristan, do you have faith in two additional task forces? Are they going to get to the bottom of this? And then Susan, the second part is, meanwhile, whistleblower information keeps coming out. So what's most effective? Let's start with you, Tristan. So I will say I'm not a huge believer in task forces. And again, maybe that's informed by, you know, again, going down to Secret Service headquarters and reading the 95 task force and the 2014 one. And again, they haven't moved the needle because they can't implement the changes. So again, you've either got to have Secret Service taking those recommendations. What's different to me about the congressional task force is they could, if they had the political will, they could enforce all kinds of things. They can direct certain approaches. They control the funding. There are many things they could do. So I don't view that in a different way at the end of the or I don't view that as a typical task force. Congress should do oversight. You had multiple committees, you had oversight, you had the uh, Judiciary Committee and the Homeland Security Committees all doing their different things. We had some whistleblowers from Empower Oversight, and so we were routing them to all these different committees, and it's still the same way on the Senate side. So they've got to focus their oversight efforts. That makes sense to me. But again, what's, what's more important than having the group of individuals just looking at it in the House is that they have to, again, have the political will to whatever it is they come up with to enforce that on the Secret Service. 
So I think that will have the biggest impact, whether the outside protective mission or outside panel digs up additional good recommendations, that's great, but, but whether DHS implements them, that's the million dollar question. Certainly that is the million dollar question. And right now, you know, we don't, how can we trust uh, Mayorkas' ability to execute change? Uh, you did have Ron Rowe, the acting director, give this pep talk that I um, did get a copy of the recording of um, to, to the Secret Service. And he said a lot of good things, okay? He, he, it was a great pep talk. He talked about the technology. They're going to integrate the technology to make it interoperable. Uh, they're going to get more money for the agents. They're not going to do, they're not going to ask them to do more with less. They're not going to overwork. Well, wait a second. This is like a big aircraft carrier. How are you going to turn this thing around quickly? You're not, okay? And who was responsible for those management decisions? Ron Rowe is Director Cheadle's right-hand man. Mayorkas appointed Ron Rowe. Why did that happen? Certainly somebody needed to take the reins that knew how the Secret Service operates. But did it need to be Cheadle's right-hand man? I'll leave that up for discussion. I certainly, the rank and file, are fed up. Absolutely fed up. They are the, a counter sniper. The day of the Senate hearing, I got an email that was sent to the entire uniform division from a fed up counter sniper. And they said, basically, there was a new division created for research and development. And it was basically dealing with, we need to have drones. The first call I got after the assassination attempt that night, the first text I got was about the drone program. Why isn't it up and running? This has been an issue since 2016. People pushing for it inside of the agency, outside the agency. They have drone mitigation technology, but they don't have um, a widely used non-tethered drone system. And I'll be doing some more reporting on that in the upcoming days. But it is, these people are fed up. They're gonna have, they have this innovation technology. The guy said, the counter sniper uh, said, too little, too late. A little too late. Then um, someone asked him, did you mean to send that to everybody in the uniform division? And he said, absolutely, I did. And I, I am very, very concerned. He had his name on this. Very, very concerned that all that there's going to be another assassination attempt before November. And you have not, you've all patted us on the head as we've told you that the technology is outdated. And there's a joke in the Secret Service that it's yesterday's technology, tomorrow. That's the joke. And I just think these rank and file deserve better than what they're getting. Uh, we certainly need um, the ta also the whistleblowers are coming to anybody who will listen, coming to me that they someone they trust. I've been working on these stories since uh, Jason Chase. I think you had the best hearings. We've had two hearings on Capitol Hill since um, the Butler. You had a number of hearings, and I attended every single one of those, or I listened to them online. And um, it, it, that's what needs to happen again. Um, Congress is out of session right now. That's unfortunate timing. But uh, it was the work that these two did and their, and their entire committee was exceptional. And I think it, it's sad that when Jason you left, then some of this stopped. Um, and it needs, you cannot just, it's not, you can have to continue holding their feet to the fire constantly. And I think, it, you know, obviously with Mayorkas, I don't see a change happening there. Um, you know, needs, new leadership needs to happen, and we can talk about exactly who we think is best for that. So uh, last question, and then we'll open it up. Um, on Friday, we learned that five Secret Service agents have been placed on leave. Thursday. Thursday, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, is that the right action, and are they the right people? I'll start with you. So Susan and I have discussed this at length. As a, as a personnel nerd, as a lawyer, right, then, so they actually were not placed on leave. No one's been placed on leave as far as we know. They've been given administrative duties, and that's significant because if they were to place them on leave, right, that can be something that you do when someone's under investigation, and we actually have seen when people were placed on leave for too long, so Congress has limited it. 
but this is not what they did. They just sent them to telework and gave them administrative duties. And that's important because they should have done it on day one. This should have happened the evening of July 13th. And so when Ron Rowe comes before Congress and says, you know, we got to go through this process, we're looking at this, there's not going to be consequences for anybody there, it's just really, it's, he, he is refusing to pursue any sort of accountability. And again, that's fine that they want to do an investigation, but they should have put individuals that they thought might have been a part of the problem, they should have sent them home on day one. And again, they're doing work from home, that's good for the taxpayers actually, right, that's fine but they should have taken them out of any sort of protective roles right from the outset. And I think that the reason that they haven't is because they are afraid once they do that, once there start being real consequences for people, that those people who are on the ground, if you're getting stuff like discipline, they're gonna say, well, hold on a second. We asked you for more resources. We asked you for this. I think people on the ground level will very quickly start pointing fingers upward as they have been to both of us. So, oh. so that even that five five individuals uh, headline which got so much attention really is not an indication of any new progress right and so i actually had reported the day before that there had been only the pittsburgh office uh, and they were not on leave that, that didn't start this week okay or on administrative duties um deferring to Kristen, Tristan on that because um i did say administrative leave and he corrected me on that they are put on leave, okay, over the next 24 hours. That, that was like two weeks ago. That, that wasn't just this week as CNN and Fox News, sorry, um, indicate, thought, thought reported. I, I had that information for a week and a half. I just had to execute it. And so then in the next 24 hours, we learned that, oh, the, the Trump detail site agent was also put on leave. Was that in response to my story? I don't know. I kind of, I suspect it was because I'd been very critical and Dan Bongino is on the next panel, had been very critical about the fact that no one from the Trump detail was on leave and we suspected that Pitt's Pitt whole suspect, sus, dissension in the ranks, it was creating dissension in the ranks for only the Pittsburgh office to be on, on administrative duties. Um, and so we thought that the, fit, the thought was that the Pittsburgh office was going to take the fall, when really it is really upper management. So why aren't they on leave too? You know, they are the ones that made the resources decisions. And Ron Rowe has said that he is not responsible for those under oath. He said that he was not responsible for any of those. Whistleblowers have since come forward to us and said he's directly responsible for cutting the counter surveillance units that roam around and would have found Thomas Crooks especially if he had a range finder, if he put a range finder up to the crowd. Now you asked me, and I don't think I answered it, about whether these task force, multiple, the FBI and this task force is gonna to get to the bottom of it. I think it's very confusing right now for whistleblowers. Uh, they're asking me who to turn to because there's the Senate, the Senate, or individual senators are doing, that have a great amount of experience, Senator Grassley and Senator Ron Johnson, who was a Homeland Security chairman, during back when Jason was there, um, as well on the his counterpart, and they had experience in this. But it's so confusing for these whistleblowers. They're saying, who do I need to talk to? Tristan's helping them, and I'm saying, let's figure out a way to facilitate this, but that's not my role. Um, so it's confusing, and I think multiple task forces aren't great. I think the Homeland Security Committees in Congress need to do this consistently, regularly, like Jason did. Jason, you had a comment? I couldn't help, <laughs> I couldn't help this. I gotta mention two things. If you look at the, and Elon Musk uh, tweeted this uh, yesterday, um, information technology strategic plan for Homeland Security. Uh, their number one goal, DEI, diversity, yeah. equity, inclusion. That's their number one goal. We're talking about technology. This is their number one goal. The other thing I take a little personally, I know I'm a little too close to this, but if we recall, when we were doing a hearing with the Secret Service director and it got a little heated, what happened a few minutes into that hearing? The deputy to the Secret Service director sent out an email saying it's time, and I'm paraphrasing, it's time to make this an even fight. Let's go get Jason Chaffetz. 42 Secret Service agents dove into my background to try to find something. They gave me this political enema 
Trey Gowdy later said, what are you doing? Jason Chavis is like the most boring person in Congress. I could have told you that. You didn't need to send 42 Secret Service agents in there. And guess what? It was totally inappropriate. They were going after me because I was a chairman asking hard questions. And you know what? Nobody was fired. Nobody was dismissed. Some people got paid time off. That's a vacation. That's the kind of the way they, they approach this. And, and the Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, had the gall to call me and say, oh, well, we've been through this. It took him a year to do that investigation. I wasn't shot as a candidate for the presidency of the United States. This is how they operate. And until there's a fundamental change, top to bottom, with the management, starting with Secretary Mayorkas, starting with the Secret Service Director, bringing somebody in from the outside, I don't think any of this is going to change. And when your number one goal for the next four years on dealing with technology is DEI, we got a problem, folks, and it's got to be solved because it's not just Secret Service. It's TSA. It's right on down the line. FEMA, if you keep going down the list, this is where this current administration's priorities are. All right, I am afraid we are out of time, uh, <laughs> but I want to thank our guests and uh, Jason for putting a spotlight on Secret Service going back decades, unfortunately, and uh, what is happening today. So thank you very much to both of our speakers.